My name is Gene, G-E-N-E, -E, middle initial E, Spicer, S-P-I-C-E-R. What is your birthday? 8-13-30. Where were you born? Uh, in Indiana. Oh. So tell me about your family and siblings when you were growing up. I have one brother 10 years younger than I. We were the only children. My father was a, uh, was too young for the World War I, too old for World War II, so he was not a military person. Uh, I had an uncle who was in the Mexican War, but I guess I was the first to be, to be military because my grandfather wasn't, and you know, my father wasn't. Yeah. So your father was too young for the World War One and too old for the, the World, World War II. Yes. Wow, that's a yeah. very interesting combination. Yeah. Isn't yeah. It? So what school did you go to in, in Indiana? What was the town name? In DuPont, Indiana. I, I graduated from DuPont High School in 1948. After graduation, farmed with my father for a while on a small farm. And, uh, and then 1950 came along. Uh, it was a Korean uh, conflict. I knew I was going to be drafted at some time. So I talked to my buddy, who was Robert Everhart, and we enlisted, and they told us we could uh, become a tanker. And uh, just as soon as we raised our hand and said, I do, they said, there's a change in plan, gentlemen, because we're going to, you're going to the 101st Airborne. Oh, 100 what? 101st Airborne, Screaming Eagles. They're, they're in, uh, they're, the, the 101st is still very active, the 101st Airborne is very active. But we were there only long enough to go through basic training, uh, and they shipped us to Korea immediately there. When did you enlist? Do you no, November the 3rd, 1950. So you knew that already Korean War broke out? Yes, How yes. did you know that? Well, newspapers and such. I didn't really understand because I was a young man, uh, just 20 years old, mm -hmm. and I did not really understand uh, what it was all about, but I found out. Uh, went through, of course, like I say, went through basic with the 101st, and then they shipped us to Korea immediately then. Yeah. So where did you get the basic training? At Camp Breckenridge, Kentucky, which is uh, just across the river from, from Evansville, Indiana, just across the Ohio River from Evansville, Indiana. So you got the basic as 101st Airborne? Yes. Ah, so what kind of basic training was that? A rifleman. I was a rifle. Just rifle? Uh, yeah, yeah. And did you know that you were headed to Korea? I, we had a pretty good idea. A lot of draftees at that same time, all going through basic the same as we was, and uh, we knew that we were uh, basically asked what was going to happen to us. A few of them got to do other things, uh, didn't go to uh, didn't go to Korea. But the biggest part of the people who went through basic training at Camp Breckenridge, Kentucky, went to Korea. So were you afraid, actually, or scared that you're going to go to Korea and war? I think I was too young and too dumb to be scared. <laughs> <laughs> uh, really, it just, uh, uh, truthfully, I was looking forward to seeing some things and doing some things that uh, I'd never done before. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a young man, uh, uh, I you know I'd never been out of the uh, the state of Indiana very much, and uh, except for uh, you know a high school trip to Florida once, and just and just raised out in the country and was kind of looking forward to seeing some things, and I didn't get to see a lot. Yeah. But you didn't expect that you'll be ending up in Korea, right? No, and uh, you know I, there I, were other options that you could go, and it was Germany, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we had, uh, there was, I think there was about five in our unit who went to Germany uh, after basic training. They had, uh, they were kind of specialists. One of them was an artist, uh, and I don't know why he got shipped to go to Germany, but anyhow, he went to Germany. There were a couple others who were uh, uh, people who were office-type people, 
uh, and they went to Germany also. There were some of them also that stayed there at Camp Breckenridge for the full two years that they were drafted. Uh, so when did you leave for Korea? In February of 1951. Was We've, it troop ship? Uh, yes. Uh, we were the first group that the military flew from uh, their basic training unit to uh, California. We, we were one of the first to get to fly, and uh, we flew out uh, on the old C, from the old C-46. Uh, uh, at that time, was run by Flying Tiger Airlines. They flew us from uh, Little Kentucky to Oakland, California, and then we was at Stoke Camp Stoneman for a week in California, and then we boarded the USS General Mann uh, in, in the harbor there in San Francisco, and 11 days later, uh, we were in Yokohama. Hmm. What did you do in Yokohama? Well, I was there long enough to get on a, a bus to go to Camp Drake, Tokyo. Camp Drake? Uh, yes, Camp Drake in Tokyo. And there we was uh, in, in a replacement, a repel depot they call it, and we were there for about I don't know, about a week, something like that, while the orders came. And then we were put on a train uh, from Tokyo to Sasebo. And that was a beautiful trip down through the country, really. Uh, and at Sasebo, we spent a couple of days there. Uh, and, uh, and across the bay, uh, uh, the Sea of Japan, uh, by a uh, ferry boat and arrived in Pusan then. Uh, when did you arrive in Pusan? Uh, probably the 1st of March, something like that, yeah. And then from Pusan up to Eskom City, mm -hmm. which is just on the south side of Seoul, and that was, there was a repel depot there, and that's when I was assigned to the 24th Infantry Division. To the signal company of the 24th, they were needing radio operators, and so they set up a school that uh, trained us to be radio operators. So I spent some time there. Uh, until then, the where did you go? Then I went to, uh, to the 19th, as soon as the school was over, went to the 19th Infantry Regiment, and they were online at that time. Mm -hmm. Where? Uh, in the Seoul area. That I don't, I was a young man, you know, I I can look at those maps of Korea, and I I, I can't remember where I was. I can still see those hills in my head and those valleys and all the war torn material was there, but I, I was never able to find them again on a map or anything like that because I was a private and I did what uh, what I was told to do. So you stayed. Around Seoul all the time when you were. I in think Korea? I think we actually ended up in Wonsan. I think it was where we after where we actually ended up was in Wonsan. That was where, that was when the, fortieth. How did you go to Wonsan? Was it through Incheon and ship, or did you just march in there? Uh, well, we were we were in the Seoul area, and then in. Uh, uh, they moved the whole division. The, the division moved up through, you know, by trucks and such, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, what was the mission in one time? Uh, there was, there was a, uh, a horrendous battle going on at that time, and uh, I think the, I'm not sure, but I think the second division was, <clears throat> was needing help, so they shipped the 24th up to uh, help to uh, oppress the Chinese that was there at that time. Was it one son? <coughs> I'm, I'm not sure. No, no. Son was, uh, no, no, no. It was around Chukchan, north of Chukchan? Could be. I yeah, don't, I, you know, I, uh, as a young man and a private, I only did, only went where I was supposed to go and did what I was supposed to do, and I didn't know anything. So what was the <coughs> typical day of your service there when you were in Seoul and you, when you moved off to the north? I was basically a radio operator, a uh, truck driver part of the time, a uh, radio operator, and we worked uh, a Morse code radio uh, with, uh, uh, to do uh, uh, 
keep in contact with the battalions and, and also with, with, with the divisions. So my basic job that I had while I was in Korea was a, uh, was, was a, was a radio operator, yeah. So what was the sort of operation, what, what kind, were you involved in the battle uh, radio operation or what did you do? We were just uh, <coughs> set up to, to uh, send messages back from, uh, from the headquarters uh, company that I was in, either up to the battalion headquarters or back to the division headquarters. That mm -hmm. was basically it, yeah. Mm -hmm. We never knew what the messages was really because we were, uh, they, they were in Morse code and they were uh, encrypted, so we were just radio operators, yeah. So you learned that <coughs> in the school when you arrived yes. in ESCOM City. Yeah, yes. And was it hard to do it or what? Well, I think it was fairly easy because we knew that if we didn't learn something like that, uh, we'd be a rifleman and it would be a lot worse, yeah. I think I was fortunate in that uh, uh, I wasn't in a line company. I was in headquarters company, and it was just a little bit easier in headquarters. So what was your rank at the time? I went over as a private mm -hmm. and came back as a PFC. <laughs> I came back to the States in, in uh, I guess it was in March of 52 when I came back to the States. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So what did you do after you? I uh, in I was they put me on the west coast in an anti-aircraft outfit. I was in San Francisco uh, for a while and then was transferred to uh, San Pedro, California. And then on November the third of 1953, I was discharged from the regular army. I went back to Indiana, uh, joined the National Guard. Uh, I finally got to be on a tank. Because oh, it was a tank, <laughs> if I, if I got to be with the tank, and I was a, the combo sergeant for a tank company in a, a, a National Guard unit. I spent three years with the National Guard, and, and, and uh, when I left them, I was a sergeant first class. Mm -hmm. I went to school then. Uh, one of the guys I worked with uh, was an officer during World War II, and he suggested I use my GI Bill to go to school, and I didn't think I was smart enough, but he told me that I was older now and I would understand what was going on, so I, I applied for uh, admission to the University of Kentucky mm. in 1956, and I got a, in three and a half years, I had a bachelor's degree in, in education, mm. ag education, and, uh, I uh, graduated in 1960, January of 1960, with a bachelor's degree. Uh, immediately began teaching and, uh, in Kentucky for a short while and then came back to Indiana later on. Uh, then what as, did you teach? I taught agriculture. I taught ag how, to <laughs> how to farm, <laughs> basically that. Uh, because you were a farmer, right? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. The uh, the first year I taught was was simply amazing. Uh, I taught in a little town called Oil Springs, Kentucky, and that is just about as far east in Kentucky as you can get without being in West Virginia. Mountains, hills, hollers, coal mines. Uh, just like Korea. Yeah, coal mines and oil and a lot of at that time a lot of oil drilling going on. <clears throat> I can tell you the young man that got the education that year was me because that, uh, uh, those people were <clears throat> those people were very nice, very good, but uh, uh, I, we, we had a saying there at that school. We taught reading and writing on Route 32. <laughs> and the Route 32 is how to get the hell out of Paintsville, Kentucky to, to Portsmouth, Ohio so you could get a job. <laughs> <clears throat> then I came, uh, I left Kentucky, came back and taught some more in, in, uh, in uh, Indiana, and uh, after a few years was offered a commission with the National Guard. And so I spent another 20-something years with the National Guard after that. I uh, got my commission, and when I retired, I was a Brigadier General. 
Wow, that's a long career and from private, I mean, from what is it, private yes. GFC to yeah. sergeant first class and you became brigadier general. Well, some, somewhere down the line. I started, out as a, I started out as a first lieutenant with my commission. When and did you get the first lieutenant? I think it was, it was in, the, in the 70s, about 1975 or something like that, yeah. About 1975. I was a company commander of one of the local guard units for a few years, and then uh, uh, the chance, with chance to advance, uh, I had to move to a, a different place. I uh, become a DS3 who was in charge of training for the battalion. Training? Yes, in charge of training for the for that particular the 51st battalion. It was. It's 50? First Battalion of 38th Division, yes. And I was in charge of training for that for two or three years. Training? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Of 31st Division? 38th. 38th Division. Yeah. <coughs> and then uh, they needed a battalion commander at a at a, another uh, another town, and I was offered that position, and uh, along with that, moved up in rank. Uh, continued to move up in rank, and I took over a battalion in Columbus. Was there for a few years, and then they needed a regimental commander in another town. And at that time, I made full bird colonel. At that time, I had advanced to where I, was, I could make full bird, and I was a colonel in for a while. And, uh, and they needed an S four in, in in headquarters in Indianapolis, uh, in charge of supplies, and so I went there. And did, the, and did that job, uh, and then an opening come up for as a deputy commander of the south, of the south part of the state of Indiana, and with the rank of brigadier, brigadier general. When did you become the brigadier general? Oh, let's see, I was nine years, that was nine years before I retired, I re retired in 2004, yeah. yeah. So, uh, nine years, yeah, right? Yes. So, uh, 1995? Yeah, probably about that time, yes. What were you in charge? Uh, I was deputy commander of the southern half state of Indiana as, as, as Brigadier General. One star? One star. That's a... <laughs> from Indiana, you were a farmer and you yeah. went to, you know, yeah. to reserve and yeah. then become the criminal veterans yeah. and then you went up all this ladder to become yeah. Brigadier General. Yes. Wow, that's yeah. a blessed life. Well, I was very fortunate. We just keep moving and yeah. promoting. Yeah, I was very fortunate. There were some openings came up, and I learned a long time ago that if you want to advance in anything, you surround yourself with good people. And my people was actually the ones that helped me become my rank that I ended up with because I took my good people with me. Uh, You're too humble. Well, they were they were good and they they were good men, really good men. Yeah. So tell me, let's go back to your service and uh, what was the most difficult thing for you during the Korean War? There's something that sticks in my mind. It wasn't difficult, but uh, when we went up on in August to help the second division, <coughs> in once you mean the area? Yeah, okay. in the area. We went up there. Uh, of course, I was a radio operator. I wasn't online like a lot of guys, but uh, we we were in this position, and I went up on the hill to set up for for uh, radio communications, and I come upon a dead Chinese soldier. Dead playing. Chinese? Yeah, he was dead. He was a Chinese soldier, had been killed. And uh, the thoughts that went through my mind at the time, and still it sticks in my mind, that there was a man who was in the military who died doing what he was supposed to do, <clears throat> but he had a mother and a father back in China who never knew what happened to him. And that's a horrendous part of war is the unfortunate people who get hurt. Most of the times it's moms and dads 
and actually in uh, while we were in Korea, the poor children, my God, uh, no uh, retreating, trying to stay out of the enemy's way and retreating, cold, hungry. Uh, that is the part about that you don't want to talk about because it's just so horrendous for 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 those young people. Uh, I have no love for a. Uh, an, an enemy soldier if he's trying to get rid of me. But I thought about that young man laying there on that hillside. I thought about his mother. And she went to her grave, I'm sure, not knowing what happened to him. Because the Chinese, they didn't retrieve their people. They just left them. <clears throat> that's, uh, that's the thing that stuck in mind. I was for, like I said, I was fortunate that I wasn't in the battle all the time. Although I was, at times was up there carrying a the radio for for the uh, uh, regimental commander while he was making contact with other people and I seen what was going on but that's the thing that stuck in my mind the most yeah uh, our duty was uh, every day seven days a week so many hours on so many hours off uh, uh, at, you know basic as a radio operator yeah the uh, war is bad, I'd do it again, absolutely. I, and one of the reasons why I think that I would do that again is because in uh, 2004 I went back to Korea as a, at the, uh, as a veteran of the Korean campaign at the invitation of the Korean government, was there five days, and I could see at that time what we had been able to accomplish. And I, I thought about that, and then just last year, last August, my wife and I left here, the United States, and went back to Korea. Uh, we were gone 15 days, and we took the, the same route, basically the same route that I took in 1951, because I wanted to see where I had been. The South Korean people are so amazing in, in their ability to work and do and uh, want to want to you know want to better their lives. Uh, while I was there this time I went up on the DMZ with the 25th ROK division and uh, when you look across that DMZ into North Korea, nothing there. Uh, those, they just have nothing. And they've been brainwashed so much, it's unbelievable. I was fortunate at one time to take a, while I was there, we took a plane ride of a night. And you can tell exactly where the 38th parallel is because there's no lights north of the 38th parallel. And it's, it's hard for me to understand how people can become so brainwashed that they just uh, will do what somebody tells them to do. I don't know how you get rid of people like that, the people in charge. Uh, I don't even consider them part of the human race because I think they're, they're something else. You said, you told me that you took a lot of pictures when you yes. uh, went back to yes. the older wells that yes. you've been there yes. in 2014, right? Yes, yes. Do you have the picture with you? Uh, they're, they're downstairs. Downstairs, <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah, there, yeah. In, yeah. Uh, I, I have them with me, yes. yes. One of the things I that I was thoroughly engrossed with was all the monuments in South Korea to the, uh, they call it the United Nations. Uh, they don't mention the, the 24th Division except by their cell far, but they talk about the United Nations and, and so many monuments of President, Mac, of, of General MacArthur, uh, uh, and I talked to some Korean people, older Korean people, and they 
they think of General MacArthur as a god mm -hmm. <laughs> because what he actually accomplished. Or Incheon uh, Landing. Oh, uh, the Incheon Landing, especially, yeah. Uh, it, uh, the trip was really worth the time. I, uh, it just kind of, uh, what I'd done in 1950-51, I think was well worth it. Tell me about the life when you were serving in Korea. How was it? Where did you sleep? What did you eat? How was the life? And how did you have any Korean boy working for you? Or tell me those. When we were in when we were in that school at Escom City, and incidentally that well, that was just at the same time there was a there was an an offensive. Uh, the the U.S. troops were on offense because the Chinese were driving south and they came through Seoul. That they moved us from Escom City to another town. And I don't know what the name of yeah, it was. Yeah. It, it was. It was a local place. And we went into this particular building they had, which was, I think was a city building, and they set the school up again. But at that time, we had a houseboy. Uh, I can't remember what his name was, but he was a very young, uh, smart person. And he worked with us then as, far, as long as we were in the school. I, when we left, I don't know what happened to him. Once I got back up on, in the 19th Regiment, uh, we didn't have any houseboys or anything like that. I, uh, everything was handled by the American troops themselves. The, 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 the mess section was all American. Uh, everything was done by American troops. Because up online you don't you know you don't really have time to 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 have somebody who is a houseboy. Uh, while we were online, you were uh, you know like every other GI, you were sleeping outside. Uh, when we were back in reserve, uh, we would try to set up a compound where you could sleep in a pup tent. And now uh, the last winter we was there in '52, when we was back in reserve, we had a squad tent set up and. Uh, uh, with a one stove in the squad tent, and that was where we was able to sleep and uh, sit around and tell stories. Yeah. Did you eat mostly C-ration, or did you have a hot meal? We had hot, the headquarters company had hot meals, yes. I learned how to drink my coffee without cream or sugar, because when they pour hot coffee in a canteen cup, and you put sugar and cream in it, it makes it go cool real quick, like in the middle of winter time. <laughs> So you don't use that. So I drink my coffee black now, because that's what I learned there. I, I still I, I have a book of the 24th Division that I bought while I was over there. I knew they was they was making a book, and I paid for it while I was there. And two years later, I received it, and I've almost wore that book out looking at the pictures and and uh, of what we were doing and what we, where we had been. Yeah. How much were you paid when you were in Korea? You know, I think my pay was $95 a month. Mm. What did you do with that money? Uh, it was, uh, most of my money was uh, sent back home to, uh, back to my parents. I sent money back to my parents. Uh, I had no use for money in Korea because there wasn't anything to buy. We were furnished a ration of beer by the, by the, uh, uh, by the Army. Uh, we were furnished our food. Uh, now, when I went on R&R &R to J J Japan, I needed a little money then because that was quite a wild experience. Um, we'll save that. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, what is Korea to you, personally? What does Korea, what is Korea in your brain and in your life? What does that stand for for you? I think I never never thought of it about that about that, but I think Korea was. You never knew before. No. You never, never had any hope that Korea would be like this when you no, left. No, none. What is Korea to you now? Oh, it's beautiful. It's the most modern. It's the most modern country in the world now. They, their their highways. 
their train system, the, the, the bullet trains uh, in the cities, uh, the high-rise, uh, all the high-rise apartments they have, uh, their methods of communication, the people there are happy and, uh, and they want to work. Uh, I think that's what, what we did. God, it was well worth it. Absolutely. Uh, and I, I, I think that was probably the last time we've been able to do something as, as an American soldier that uh, bettered the people. Since then, I don't know. Uh, you can't let politicians be involved in war. I use the word do-gooder because I think there are too many do-gooders in this world who don't understand the misery and the un being so unfortunate as to live there of what these people have to go through. And uh, with Desert Storm, we were in now there so quick. I I didn't get to go to Desert Storm. I volunteered to go, but they told me I was too old. But uh, I don't know what we accomplished. And then when we go back the second time for Desert Shield, we spent all that time and all that money. And then we give them a day and we're going to move out. Even a child knows you can't tell the enemy what you're going to do. And that's what we have done for the past 20-something years. You absolutely cannot do that. Uh, it's War is horrible, I admit that. You know, as a good example, uh, Korea is a tremendous example. Japan is another example of what they've been able to do because we stayed there. Yeah. Uh, I know at the end of World War II, I've, I've read and I've talked to GIs from World War II that uh, if we'd have pulled out, of, if we'd have pulled out of Germany like we pulled out of Iraq, Germany would be right back where they are. You have to have years to train the young people about what they should be doing to better themselves. So the farm boy from Indiana, going through all this change, but you went to Korea now, and Korea you it's a country that you didn't know, you didn't have any home. Yeah. Now it's a big part oh, yes. in your life. Yes. Mm. That was why I wanted to go back again the second time. I really, I wanted to see it. In and 2014. I yeah, 2014, and I got to see it. We had a, 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 a guide who picked us up in Pusan, and, and we spent the next six days with him. Uh, his name is Shrek. I, that's all I can remember. But he was a wonderful, uh, he had served in the Korean Army along with the uh, United States. And so I got I got a good tour of of Korea with him. He was very good, very very gracious, and uh, and I noticed that with all the people in Korea. Tell me about Twenty Fourth Infantry Division reunion here in Laughlin. Uh -huh. How many people are actually in Twenty Fourth Infantry Division that group, and what do you do here, and yeah. what is your plan? Uh, this is the West Coast Bunch, uh, uh, started by Dan Richter uh, several years ago uh, as a group who w wanted to meet uh, someplace on the West Coast uh, in addition to the annual reunion that they have in September. The 24th has had an annual reunion basically in September ever since the end of World War II. Uh, in some city in the United States, uh, and this is the 24th Infantry Asso Association, 
and this has continued through the years. Uh, and then we had these the groups such as the West Coast Bunch wanted to be in addition to that. There's a group who meets in uh, Gatlingburg, Tennessee in the spring of the year because they want uh, a smaller group uh, than, you know, than the, uh, the, than, than the big group. Uh, less coordinated, I think that's the word I'm looking for. And that's what we're doing here. We're at, this is part of the West Coast Bunch. We're just kind of a, a non-coordinated group of people. We're sitting around telling stories. Uh, we're going out this afternoon and, uh, and have a picnic at, a, at one of the members' houses. Uh, there are 40 uh, members and, uh, and their wives who are here for this. Uh, we come in on Sunday, Monday, uh, Tomorrow is kind of a, I call it a bull shepherd's day in which they tell stories and enjoy talking to each other. And then uh, Wednesday will be a continuation of that and Wednesday night we'll have a banquet. And you are invited to come at the banquet and talk a little bit about what we're doing. Uh, at our banquet we will have a, a pre presentation of the colors. I've got an ROTC unit coming in from Bullhead City to do that for us. And they're going to do some close order drill for us, show us just a program. Uh, I'm not, uh, I've did this before. I did the national show two, two years ago in Louisville, Kentucky. So I had an idea of what I was doing, doing. But I found that this one was harder to put on the one in Louisville. <laughs> when, is going to, when is going to be annual? Uh, it'll, the annual one will be sometime in September. I don't know the exact Where? date. Fort Benning, Georgia. This is going to be the big one this time. Mm. Uh, because uh, our president, Tom Appler, uh, of the, so, president, he's the president of the association, uh, he has been meeting with uh, Desert Storm 24th Division people, people who we've never had in the association before. And he's meeting with them and we are going to correspond our meeting with theirs and also Merrill's Marauders, uh, what's left of them from World War II. So there will be Korean War veterans too there? Yes, absolutely, more. Would you let me know yes. the events and yes, invite I can. me? Yes. Any other message you want to leave to this interview? No, not really. I'm glad I did what I did and I would do it over again. Uh, I despise the, not despise, that's not the word I'm looking for. I'm not very happy with the people who think if you just let the enemy come in and do what they want, they will go away. They're not going to do that. Uh, Somebody, well, the old expression that I've seen used year in and year out, and I wear T-shirts to say this, freedom is not free. You have to take up the sword to be free. That's right. Yep. General, thank you so much for inviting me to this reunion in uh, Lafayette. Nevada. I'm going to meet a lot of Korean War veterans yes. here, and it is my honor to listen from you, and we want you to know that the Korea is now because you fight for us, yep. so we never forget, and we thank you, mm -hmm. and I hope that we can have a good time here in Lafayette. Yes, we will. All right, and you promised me to ask your granddaughter who is going to be yes. the teachers to contact me. Yes, I will. And also all other information yes. we share 